Welcome to Sam's Business Growth Show. I'm Sam Dunning, a digital marketing, sales, and business growth evangelist. Tune in and subscribe today as I'll be interviewing business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. You'll be learning their story, how digital marketing has helped them along the way, and exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your own business. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to a fresh episode of Sam's Business Growth Show. And I'm delighted today to be joined by Patrick Tinney. Patrick is the founder and managing partner of Centroid Training and Marketing. He's one of the most published authors on business negotiations in Canada. And over his 30-year career, Patrick has concluded multi-million dollar media sales and negotiation solutions for many of Canada's largest advertisers. Patrick, a very warm welcome, sir. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm great. Thanks for having me on, Sam. Come on, let's rock today. Let's I'm have it. Look I'm looking forward <laughs> to it, man. Cool, man. Love the energy. Love it. So there's plenty we'd want to learn from yourself today, Patrick. Um, and I think we're going to take the angle of negotiation, as, as you've written several books, as we were talking before we started recording. So, and this is a topic I'm interested in, particularly as I'm reading quite a lot about it right now. And it's not something we've really covered on the show much. So I think it's going to be really useful as I think we've all been in a scenario, um, certainly I have recently, where there's, we've sent out a proposal, we've done a presentation or a pitch, and we've, we've kind of, we think everything's going well, and then it gets to the final point, and we, we start, the, the customer at hand or the prospective client starts trying to beat us down on price. So we think everything's gone well, and they're saying, well, everything looks good, Sam, but uh, if you can, if you can uh, sharpen your pencil, if you can get the price a bit better, then we might be in a position to, to move forward. So if we can talk about that, um, but before we get into this juicy negotiation strategy, Patrick, myself and the audience would love to know a bit of background on yourself. Um, so if you give us perhaps a quick snapshot of how you got into sales, why you decided to kind of write, your, write all these, these books that are really successful and, and perhaps any lessons that you learned along the way, um, just to give us a bit of background on your good self, sir. Well, um, I'll take you way back and then I'll bring you way forward. Um, I was born into uh, a family that was very modest. Um, I'll tell you how modest. There was no indoor plumbing in Canada. Uh, That's quite modest. Just visualize that. And uh, so um, my uh, my father was involved in a um, uh, in a construction project in a small town, and um, for whatever reason, he and his partner didn't uh, divvy up the proceeds evenly. I'm going to be very kind. So we had to move to um, Hamilton, Ontario, which is like steel town. It's like Pittsburgh. It's like Allentown in the United States. It's very industrial. And, um, and then my father paid everybody back, which, which you do when you live in a small town because your word is your word. And um, about a month after he paid everybody back, I would have been about nine years old. He was working at, uh, as a welder at uh, International Harvester. Um, uh, working on the very large cultivation machines in the uh, agricultural business, and he dropped dead. So I had to um, I had to go and make money. I mean, we, there was no money in our home, and my mother, who was 39, had to go back and get a grade 12 education so, so that she could become a stenographer. And she she just kind of pulled me aside and she said, Pat, she said, um, there is no money here. So uh, somehow, son, you're going to have to figure out how to go out and make money uh, enough to take care of you. I'll put a roof over your head, but you got to help me with the rest. And, um, and I'll just leave you alone to go do that. So that meant that I would take on every job in the world. I mean, it wasn't a job I wouldn't do. So as long as it was legal, uh, and <laughs> we'd, we'd have, um, we'd have people call over to the house and say, well, you know, what's Pat doing today? Well, you know, he's, um, he's, he's around. Um, would, would Pat be interested in doing some gardening? He's going to get really dirty. He's going to make five dollars and he's going to he's going to be able to drink all the pop he wants to drink all day long what does pat think about that and my mother would turn and he said he just left he's running toward you <laughs> well man how old were you then pat uh oh gosh i was really young nine years old that's uh, tough man yeah it's re really hard and uh, we lived in an apartment we didn't you know we, we had to leave the house that you know that i was born into and, you know, very quickly after that, I, you know, 
school to me was uh, was one of those strange places. It was like I I know that I was supposed to be there, but it was just like I was going through the paces. And when I got to high school, it it seemed to be even worse. Like it, high school seemed to be a place where I know I needed to have to finish, and my grades were all okay. I didn't do great in the beginning, but my grades were very good all the way through. I wrote very few exams. Uh, but I was also working up to 40 hours a week, delivering pianos, carpets, uh, groceries, anything I could do. As a matter of fact, I lied about my age to get into a piano delivery company. And um, and within about a year, I was running the whole um, uh, the whole delivery team uh, to deliver, you know, some weeks, uh, 100 pianos and organs a week. And I was using the football team at my high school and, and the... Uh, the guys from the, uh, the basketball team. So I, you know, I, I dream of big dudes, you know, that you just say, come on, man, we're going to make money today, you know? And I'd be working, uh, I'd, um, I'd get up in the morning, slam back as much food as I could, get to high school, uh, you know, get back home by about four o'clock, uh, slam back some more food, and then I'd get home at 10 o'clock and do my homework. That was me. Wow, man. <laughs> it was a funny thing, though. I was on a co-op, um, cooperative training thing, at high school and they said what do you want to do and i said oh, i don't know i said everybody else is going off to look at steel and stuff and automotive and everything else i said i'd like to see what happens inside a newspaper so anyway i walked inside the hamilton spectator daily newspaper and i i walked into the uh, the advertising department all these guys these women are sitting around and they're laughing on the phone they're talking to customers they're smoking cigarettes they're doing funny drawings and uh, you know they pack all kinds of stuff into their bags and they're saying see you at lunch man i'm gonna go out and sell a bunch of stuff today we're gonna crush it you know and that was like the whole environment it was electric so i went back to high school and i, I took myself out of you know all the sciences all the the history every i said take me out of everything that i don't need and put me into every business course i don't care who's in the class i just need to know everything about business and there was only one other guy in there so i you know that was a great thing because I was one of, of two males in a room full of females. How, how good can that get? Sounds all right to me. So oh. you got <laughs> you got a flavor for sales. You got a buzz for it. And then you it wanted was, to take all up. It was wonderful. I had a great time. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, from there, I um, I went on to, a, a, you know, local co college. Um, they wanted to teach uh, national advertising. I didn't get it right. Uh, so left there, and then I, I ended up in a really cool college in Oakville that, that taught uh, retail advertising. And I just love the whole idea of retail because retail is a bottoms-up view of the world. In the old days, uh, you know, there was this great cachet about, you know, advertising agencies, you know, we see the world and all the rest of it. I got news for everybody. If you don't cash the cash register, if, if that, uh, you know, if that deposit doesn't go through, if that credit card doesn't work, if you can't make your rent, doesn't matter what kind of products are produced. You have to have people to buy them. You need customers. And um, and to me, I just I just love that. Um, and and part of it was um, as as a young lad, um, I remember the first um, season. My dad uh, passed away. He passed away in November. And I'm sure my mother never wanted to put up a Christmas tree, but she did. I don't know how she did it. I I. I to, to this day, my heart, I, I just can't believe she did that. But um, she asked me what I wanted for Christmas. I said, Mom, buy me the biggest shovel in the world. I'm going to go out and I am going to shovel more walks than you've ever seen in your life. And uh, so I, I'd pray for snow and I'd get up. Uh, I'd get up before school. I'd go and shovel after school. I would shovel all weekend long. And I'm, I'd make like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cold calls knocking on doors of people I didn't know. And you know what? Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine my no ratio? My no ratio was over the moon. I mean, yes. <laughs> you know, if, if I got uh, if I got seven jobs in a day and I made like you know twenty or thirty bucks, which is a lot of money in those days, um, I killed it. You know, so when people say, "Oh, I got to make a cold call," what do you think this is? A rattlesnake? It's not a rattlesnake. That, that, that's a line to money. I used to walk my son up to the um, the front window of our house and I'd pull the curtains back. I'd say, Sean, what do you see out there? And he'd say, I don't know, dad, what do I see? I said, all I see is money. It's laying all over the floor. All, it's laying all over the streets. It's on the grass. All we have to do is walk up and engage people. We just talk to them and say, 
Uh, what is it you need to get done today and how can I help you? Oh, by the way, there's money involved. Great. Simple as that. Yeah. Love it. Love the love the energy, man, and love the um the 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 willingness and not not being afraid to put in the activity to make it happen. Which um Do you know what it is? You're yeah. either you're either embracing positive risk to make more money or you're not. Mm. Period. You know, professionalism really matters these days. You know, just getting a job done because you got paid to get a job done, that doesn't cut it. You know, if you want to be in that top 5%, you got to work hard. You got to work harder than everybody else. I think I was mentioning you off air. It took me seven years to finish Unlocking Yes, this book here. And then I went back two years after it was published and I rewrote it and made it twice as good. That's what it means to complete your mission. And when you're in the corporate world, or if you're an entrepreneur running a business and you have to pull your employees inside and you say, hey, listen, you know, we really had a bad quarter. I'm sorry. You got to work harder. Truth, truth. All right, Patrick. Well, that's a, definitely an interesting story. And I'm enjoying it so far. So before we talk more about your business, we'll jump back into your business towards the end of the show. And sure. we'll also talk about some of the, the marketing channels you've enjoyed to, to gain a flow of, of new inquiries and new customers. And some some of these channels that are, are ev everyone tuning in can enjoy and get stuck into. But right. the theme of today's episode is all about negotiations. So as, as I said before, it's something we've not really covered in a great deal. Um, so I'd love to, there's, there's two main things we'd like, we're going to talk about how, how good we actually think we are at negotiations versus how good we actually are. Um, so if we perhaps talk about that first, and I know off air, Patrick, you said to, to me, how good at negotiation do you think I am? And I answered with probably a, a, between a six and seven. Um, so yeah, perhaps you could shed some more, more light on that, that Patrick, that we perhaps underestimate. Do we underestimate or do we overestimate our, our um, negotiation skills? Are we worse or better than we think they are, that we should be? I honestly think I have witnessed um, in my, you know, almost three decades of working in the media business, I've witnessed people close some of the worst deals I've ever seen. As a matter of fact, I was a bit of a fixer. If the deal was was really that bad, there would be times when I'd be called in to go back in and just say to the customer, I'm sorry, they gave you something they shouldn't have given you. Um, my guys are going to be really upset on delivery. Can we just sit down and have an honest conversation of, about what it is that you should be receiving in terms of a cost so that our side makes the appropriate amount of profit and you get terrific delivery? And those are really hard conversations. Um, regarding, um, you know, how good we think we are, um, I've done over 50 book signings in a, in a very large, um, uh, book company in Canada called chapters and in Indigo. And so I've done them from our, our capital in Ottawa, right across to, uh, uh, the West side of Toronto. And, um, one of the things that really struck me, uh, about negotiation was that I really wanted to, you know, do some you know, live in the moment research. So I would hand out somewhere between 250 and 300 business cards, every book signing. Um, I would talk to people and I would ask them, I'd say, um, Mrs. Jones, you, uh, you look like a, a pretty sharp business person. Um, in the area of business negotiation, how do you, how do you see yourself on a scale of one to 10? Uh, 10 being the best one being the worst. And there'd be some pause, maybe Mr. Jones would get involved. And anyway, there'd be some rumbling back and forth and I'd get a number. And the number was usually between six and a half and seven and a half out of 10. And so I would say uh, to the person I was engaging, I would say, uh, it sounds like you're getting, first of all, fantastic and congratulations. I mean, that's a great number. Sounds like you're winning uh, somewhere around 65 to 70% of all the deals you're involved in. And the person pauses and they go, yeah, that sounds about right. I said, terrific. So how many negotiation strategies can you name? When do you use them for buyer and seller risk? And how do you identify them for time compression and time decompression effect from a tactical perspective? And the answer is one or none. 
there was a, a couple, I ran into a couple of savants that were twos, but I mean, they would shock me. I can identify somewhere between 25 and 30 of them. And I put 25 of them in the back of Unlocking Yes, the revised edition. So what I do is I, I name the negotiation strategy. I deconstruct it for you in very simple language. I tell you what the buyer risk is. I tell you what the seller risk is. I tell you how much time you have to complete that deal, or you can take as much time as you want. And I also talk about risk. Risk is really important in negotiation because, so for instance, um, you know, we talked a little bit off air about, you know, uh, you know, what about if somebody come in and they undercut you in a deal? Um, so first of all, you've got, you know, your cost modeling. So you understand where your profitability is. Um, you know that selling one of anything to a customer is difficult because you have to take them through your entire system. So you want to sell them multiples of things. Uh, the other thing is, is that you want to be able to do a SWOT analysis on the competitor that your customer is holding up as the, you know, as the it uh, that you have to beat. But while they're doing that, what they're also doing is they're using your competitor's uh, proposal as a, as a stick, if you will. And yeah, the old, the old competitive bargaining chip. I think we're all very, very familiar with that one. Well, the strategy is called share and compare. So you, you come in as a loyal, um, you come in as a, as a loyal seller and you've, you've, you've given them your proposal and they say, Sam looks great. Fantastic. Got to talk to a couple of other people. Can I get back to you in a couple of days? Sam says, sure. How, how does it look to you? Well, I, I told you it looks great. And then they come back a couple of days later and they say, Sam, man, you were so close. You were so close. You know, I, we just don't have the money. We can't afford you. And that strategy is called poor mouth. Everybody uses it. It's not a tactic, by the way. You see, large corporations use that. I've gone into gigantic corporations and I'll walk into the HR department and say, oh, Pat, we want you to come in and do a, like a day or a half a day. And, you know, we've got like 30 people we want to put in a room, maybe 40, 50, could be as many as 100. Oh, but we have no money. I don't know what we're going to do. I said, but wait a minute. You're a billion dollar corporation. What do you mean you don't have any money? Oh, well, they have money, but I don't have money. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a game, you know, and it's, you know, and if you call them out on it and you just sort of say, hey, come on, you know. Go, go next door and talk to the party who's involved, uh, who ultimately is going to receive the, the, the training and just say, um, you know, here's the quality that we're going to get. So, um, you know, Patrick Tinney has written four books. He's worked with uh, companies like KPMG. He's worked with uh, credit unions. He's worked with insurance companies. He's worked with, you know, construction folks, um, you name it. Um, newspapers, largest newspaper in Canada. I've trained those folks, you know, so the, the guy's field tested. We, we know what he does. And he's got some very um, unique ideas around how to do simulations and training sessions so uh, that the material is sticky. And I'm not presenting it this way as, as kind of an infomercial. But what I'm trying to say to you is that is that negotiation um, understood by professionals, by professional buyers, is going to eat into your pocketbook. And I'll tell you one last thing, it's really, really important. If you wanna know what your chief competitors are presenting to your dream client, do a SWOT analysis on their strengths and opportunities and you'll see everything that's gonna be in their proposal. Interesting. So what you, what your point you raised just now, Patrick, is also familiar and I can certainly relate and I'm sure a lot of people tuning in can, where, um, we send our proposal, we send our presentation, we send our quote, whatever it is. I'm, I'm referring to B2B selling right now. Um, yeah. so we've submitted our proposal, whatever it may be that we give to yeah. our clients to try and win business. And they've said, looks fantastic, looks awesome, Sam, love it. I'll come back to you. Let's say I've submitted on the Friday. I'll come back to you next week, Monday or Tuesday, and we'll get the deal done. Yeah. Like you say, crickets. Try contact them by phone, by email, by anything. Sometimes they don't respond, or maybe they respond a week, two weeks later. Sorry, we, we went with a competitor or sorry, we went another way or sorry, we did it in house or any excuse under the sun. Yep. And we're none the wiser because we don't really know what's happened internally with their organization. Um, as far as we know, the, the deal is as good as done. 
But a week or two later, we've heard, uh, and it's, it's bad news because we, we thought that deal was as good as done. How, how can we avoid that happening, Patrick? Well, uh, it actually happens much earlier in the, um, in the engagement with the client. And as sellers, most of us are people who communicate ex exceptionally well. We write great proposals. You know, we, we want to know about the customer, but we, we really don't enjoy asking the really hard questions around, are you actually going to buy? Are you interested in quality? Do you want results? Where do you see you now? Where do you see yourself now? Where do you see yourself into the future? And how can I get you there with my product? I want to be the gap between now and the business that you can't touch yet with the, um, you, you know, with, with, with the current instruments and or employees that you have on staff. So if, if those things interest you, then we have a discussion. If you want cheap and cheerful, I'll give you a list of names because you might not be a client for me. Got it. So ask, asking the right detailed and tough questions up front. Hard questions, hard questions. And I'll tell you what, it, it, see, it's even harder right now with COVID. It, it, mm. it really is. It's harder because you, you, you don't want to sort of bounce yourself out of the game too early. But I'll tell you, the, 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 the thing that's also really important right now is that, is that time is your greatest, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's your money. Time is money. I know that sounds kind of goofy, but you know, I've I, I I don't know how many people that I've heard who say, oh yeah, you know, I got this deal in my pipeline and it's coming and all the rest of it. Hey, by the way, it's happened to me. I mean, <laughs> I've been involved with some people who I've actually known personally over a over a lifetime, and they do goofy things at the end. And you know, I say, oh, come on, you can't do that stuff. We're all better than that. You know, in one case, I, 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 um, I was being guided in by an HR professional into a company. And, and when I got in there and they told me what their secret sauce was, I went, oh, my God, get me out of this building. So I largely agreed with everything <laughs> they said. And then I went home and I wrote a proposal I knew they couldn't accept so I could get away from them. Happens. Happens, man. Yeah. Interesting. Open the box slowly. Close the box slowly. Never slam the box closed and never say never. Agreed. Okay. So earlier on, Patrick, you mentioned there was different types of negotiation strategy. Um, so I know you, did you say there was 20 or so that you mentioned in your book? Was that, yeah. was that right or was I off? Yeah, I've cataloged around 25 that I put in the book. Um, okay. And, you know, I'll, you know, the easiest way to illustrate is the worst one of all is split the difference. If you ever see somebody saying, hey, Sam, you know, um, you know, if you can just come up another, you know, I don't know, cut another couple of hundred bucks on this deal, I'll split the difference with you. Well, they just asked you to give them money for free. Whoever controls the split, you have to ask yourself, why are they controlling the split and why are they so uh, willing to give it away? It's laziness. And the real estate guys, they, I mean, that's their, you know, if, if you look at, Oh, I'm going to throw a number out there. If you look at, you know, 60, 70, 80% of the real estate deals that get done, I bet you split the differences in there somewhere. It's awful. Yeah, man. I mean, that's that's probably one of the, the most common things that happens. Again, taking it back to, to B2B selling, when we've done our presentation, we've done our pitch, we're getting towards the part where we want to ask for the business. So we're asking our prospective client if it makes sense to move forward, to move ahead with a deal. Um and then they, they come back, they say, everything looks great, but if you could just sharpen your pencil, if you can maybe drop a few grand or a few hundred off the price, and I think we can move forward. So have you got any tips that, that we can utilize, Patrick, to, to make yeah. sure we're not cutting ourselves short, we're not ruining our commission check, and we're not kind of cutting our, cutting our nose to spot and that kind of thing? Exactly. So first of all, you have to understand how profitable you are. Um, it, you know, you really, really have to be, uh, have a clear understanding of, of how it is you make money or how it is you don't make money. Um, then you have to identify uh, whether this customer is going to be a one-time customer or whether they're going to be a dream customer. If they're going to be a dream customer, you may have to work your way into the tent. Um, but um, if, if they're just going to use you, be careful what you give them. Um, there's a there's a really cool negotiation strategy called the growing list, and uh, 
I've run into it a few times and I, I always giggle as, as it happens. It can happen at the front or it can happen at the back. So there's one guy that I went in to do some a business with and he said to me, he would get talking about the deal and, you know, and, and, and how much he was going to invest. And, and then he'd say, what do you think about that? And I'd say, well, you know, if it was me, I would do X, Y, and Z. And he'd say, that's a great piece of information. Don't bill me for that. That's called the growing list. It can happen on the back end. Sam, on the back end, you're just sitting there signing a deal. All right. Now, I don't know what a big deal is for you, but I, let, let me just sort of throw out a number and say 50 grand is, is interesting to you. And sure. um, and the customer looks up at you at the end and they say, oh, come on, Sam. Like, I, you know, I'm going to sign this thing off. But just as I'm doing it, could you throw in a couple of ABCs? I know they don't mean anything to you. You know, uh, they probably only represent, you know, I don't know, 5% of this deal. I mean, 5% is nothing to you. What do you say? Just as I'm closing this out, wh where are you at? For me, what it depends. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. But what you got to do is you got to call them out on it. You got to call them out on it. And you say, all right, I'm in. But I'm in uh, from the same spirit of the agreement you are. How can we make this deal just a tiny bit bigger, a bigger piece of the pie agreement, so that me giving you that 5% makes sense because I'm actually going to pick up a little bit more business which will justify the size, uh, uh, breadth and depth of this deal. Now, how does that make sense to you? And they say, well, I'm not going to give you any more. You just better cough up. Then what I would do in that situation is I would do a detailed report on exactly what that extra 5% meant and what it will mean to that customer in the future. And by the way, it doesn't happen again. Okay. So kind of breaking down exactly what they're asking for in that yeah, situation. I mean, is that what you mean? Yeah. As I say, you, you may have to climb into the tent. So, you know, there may be a little bit of give and take on the way in, but you have to be profitable. If, if, if the whole discussion is, Sam, you're a great guy, but I'm important and it doesn't matter whether you make any money. Let me put that one together slowly. <laughs> you, you're, you're basically indentured. I don't like that. We're better than that. You see, if you did that in a large corporation, um, the guys up in the credit department, the guys in the risk department, if you happen to work at a bank, the guys the guys in the risk department spend all day doing this. Um, <laughs> I know because I <laughs> I trained a bunch of bankers on uh, on on how to handle objections and uh, and how to squeeze a little bit more margin um, out in a um, uh, in a low interest environment. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting. You, you think that um, uh, there isn't a there isn't a business category that doesn't have to deal with this. And I, I, I think you, you know, you might be surprised. The only guys that really don't have to negotiate a lot are the ones that have what I would call a seller's vertical. And by that, I mean, they own the market so deeply that there is such demand and scarcity around their product. Think Apple when the Apple, you know, iPhones first came out. People were lining up for blocks. They were camping out overnight. Well, they're not going to negotiate with you. On the other hand, if you sell gravel, Sam, can you throw a couple extra couple of shovels of gravel on the back of there? You turn around and you say, I think the boss is going to be at lunch at around eleven o'clock when he usually goes. He won't be back till two, so you can count on those two extra shovels. <laughs> nice example and i think why negotiation is so valuable because like you were saying patrick it's not just important for us as business owners or sales professionals to to be able to to sell to our prospects to our clients it's also good internally even if you're not a sales professional you might be a marketer or you might be in another profession to communicate internally so if you're looking to negotiate a better job position if you're looking to negotiate with um, your manager who's getting you to try and do a task that you don't really want to be doing because it's maybe not crucial to your work. So there's so many different elements of our working lives and our personal lives where it can be useful. So it's got such a such a useful skill to, to pick up on. In, um, the, in, in the new book, The Bonus Round, what I try to get across to people is that you're negotiating up, across, and around. So when you work in a business, you negotiate up with your boss 
those are some of the brightest people in the business, by the way, because they're managing a guy who's trying to manage them. Uh, you're negotiating across because you're going to talk to a variety of different departments. You're going to say, all right, listen, I'm going to go into the credit department and say, this deal looks a little skinny, but are you with me? Because if you're not with me, I want to know now. Then you go into production. You say, all right, we're going to have to work hard on this because they're not living up to our specifications entirely. But I think if we just kind of uh, modulate our equipment a little bit, we'll be able to get this done. Are you with me? Then you go into the creative department. You say, guys, we got to make a modification here. Um, I don't want you to put too much into it, but it's got to look very professional. Are you with me? So, so what you're doing is you're negotiating across. A, 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 a and then finally, you have the people that imp implement everything into your systems. You don't look down on those people. You speak to them with great respect and say, you know what? I'm glad you came to work today. We've got a great client. We're all going to have to work uh, arms linked. Can I count on you? I like it. Yeah, it makes sense. And so we've talked about Patrick, why not splitting the difference. We've talked about how to deal with um, when your prospective clients ask you to, to add that little bit extra or take their price down that little bit. But what are some of the other negotiation strategies that are perhaps quite common um, when trying to get deals done and ways that we can overcome those? So I'm going I'm to share a funny one with you. And this is actually the, the, the title of the book, The Bonus Round. So my friend, Steve Kosick, um, uh, I, I handled the largest retail category at the um, Southern uh, group of newspapers in Canada. They were the biggest newspapers in Canada, um, X, the Toronto Star, which I also worked for at one point. And um, so he, uh, he had this really cool way of finishing negotiations that I picked up on it really early. And it just made me laugh because part of my deal was as a uh, as a corporate seller is that I would bring people in from the various newspapers that I represented across Canada. There were times when they would want to come in and personally have a seat at the table. So they made sure these guys in Toronto were doing it wrong. Right. You know, so. All right. So come on in. And then you can just see them. They they, they, they get anxious. They push their stuff onto the table too quick. They don't pace themselves. Their body language is very uncomfortable. You know, they're, you know, they got all this kind of stuff going on and they're just in the chair and, you know, the eyes are big and, <laughs> and, and, and they're talking too quickly. And so my friend, Steve Kosick at the Hudson's Bay company, and by the way, his um, budget back in the mid nineties was a hundred million dollars. He'd buy a hundred million dollars in media. Now, if you believe wow. money, if you yeah, have, wow. If you believe that money, <laughs> If you believe that money doubles every seven to 10 years, now come forward, you know, 35 years. How big is that budget? So my my piece of that budget was 12 to $13 million a year. That's what I had to fight for. I was one of the largest suppliers in there. And so Steve had this thing going when my guys would come in. It was hysterical, Sam. So he'd be sitting there looking at a deal and he kind of go, oh, oh, oh. And then the hands would start to work their way around the table. We go, oh. And start to lift big. We go, oh, my God. How am I going to explain this to my people? And holy jeez. Oh. And the person on my side would say, Steve, you're really looking troubled, man. You, you, you look, you, you look like you're almost there. Like, I think we've got a deal. Is there any way that I can help you push this across the line? At which point Steve would sit up and he'd say, what do you got in mind? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and that is called the bonus round. And it's so funny because I watched him do it so many times. And I would wait for the big pause. It would be the, oh, the head would drop. And he'd say things like, I just can't play. I don't know how they're, they just don't understand. I can't play like this. And, <laughs> and later we got together for golf after we both left, left our respective companies. I'd say, Steve, come on, man. You got to tell me about this. And he cracked a smile. He started to laugh. So he'd say, man, he said, I use that over and over and over again. <laughs> And he said, I was going to sign 95% of the deals, but I just knew if I just stalled, 
and pushed a bunch of paper around on my desk and lifted stuff up and looked down and go and hold my hand for a little bit, but not really. I'm talking to myself to create this confusion, which creates confusion on the other side of the table. And it's this, and in the end, it would be like dropping the head. Um, and, and it creates this really uncomfortable situation. Visualize this, you know, you, you're going into one of the biggest um, uh, corporations in the UK and you're dealing with their head buyer and they, and they start doing that with you, Seth. And your deal, you know, is a great deal. And you just like, you can feel it, you can taste it, you can smell it. And somebody does that to you. Yeah, you, you wouldn't know how to react. It's gonna put you on your on your, on your edge. It's gonna it's gonna be it, tough, man. It's hard. People don't like it. silence either, do they? And people don't like these kind of awkward situations. That's, well, that's no, why he's played it so well. They they don't, and that and and that's why you know uh, that's why really seasoned buyers. Now we're in a buyer's market. You got to remember, which is even worse. And I'll tell you why. You see, from from the year 1950 to around the year 2000, it, it was a seller's market, and we were trying to recover from the Second World War. It was the big baby boom, and we were building everything. We rebuilt your island. We we rebuilt all of the, uh, uh, you know, all of the uh, factories across Canada that were converted into making things like Corvette boats. We were building artillery. We were building tanks. We were building trucks. Everything. We had to go back to building agricultural uh, equipment, building cars, and so that's when you got this huge gigantic explosion in in the in the, in the retail business the year 2000 changed it flipped over globalization happened and all of a sudden you've got competitors from indonesia you got pet competitors from china you got competitors from australia you got competitors from canada oh no wait i didn't mean that but anyway you know what i mean <laughs> and so now it's you fun. have and now you have too many sellers and not enough buyers so now the buyers are even stronger and They've got access to databases. They've got access to uh, pricing channels within your sales vertical, and they uh, they know you. They've studied your your company better than you have, and if you don't study their company better than they have, you're in deep poo poo. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Truth, yeah, true, man. And before we look to to wrap things up, Patrick, is there any other negotiation, perhaps quick takeaways? That we can, um, we've we've already gone through some some real gems so far. But anything we can do to avoid the last minute panic where we say, where we just give in to our prospective customer, we say, yeah, let's get the deal done. Let's meet you in the middle. Let's let's cut a deal now because it's end of the month, and I want to get this deal done for my commission check or to hit my target or whatever it may be. Are there any little little nuggets of advice you can share with us that can prevent the the kind of harming our dead, our bottom line? Yeah, and especially important deals, Sam. So, you know, your your company, you do important deals. I do important deals with my company, the companies I represent. You know, you know the ones that are really important. So you have to invest the time into those deals so you understand the granularity of the deal. You understand the cost modeling. You understand where you can't go. You understand that it, there are some pieces of business that you can't accept under any circumstances uh, unless – the price is elevated. Um, so you got you have to understand all that stuff, and 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 you have to um, you have to go talk to your colleagues. You may have even talk to competitors. You have to do SWOT analysis on competitors. You have to do SWOT analysis on the company that you're selling to. You have to understand how relevant you are in that company, and don't be afraid to ask. And and if you don't get a deal, I love this one. This is a Sam Cohen. I think I read it in his book. You can negotiate anything. You say, I her Cohen, sorry, Sam. I understand we're not going to get a deal done today, right? You go, yeah, we're not going to get a deal done, Pat. Okay, so we both know we're not going to get a deal done. But if we could have got a deal done, what would that deal look like to you? <laughs> you want to know why you want to know that? Because the supplier that they just hired may screw up tomorrow, and they may just call you back, and you know exactly what that number is. That's a great tip. Love it, man. Mm -hmm. Nice little takeaway. Awesome. I well, appreciate you sharing this all with us, Patrick. It's been super useful. Um, so jumping back to your own business, as with the show, we always like to take the angle of, of digital marketing and how that's helped your own business. So I know we were saying before you utilize video and LinkedIn. So what are the some of the, the channels in terms of digital that have helped your business, helped you to acquire clients, acquire customers that you'd recommend to, to our listeners, to our viewers? 
Do you know, uh, I might be one of those guys that just doesn't get it. So I'm just going to say that. But I believe in building strong friendships and relationships before doing business. Because if you don't, uh, then you become a commodity. And you have to you have to understand just how good your own products are versus the rest of the market. And you have to understand where you reside in that buyer's um, food chain. So are you the number one, the number two, the number three, the number four? Because the further you get down that pecking order, the more you become a commodity and the more price will come into play. And let's be perfectly honest and say, if you're selling a really good product, you can explain that product very simply in very simple language. So if the customer buys your product and they have to sell it internally again, they can use very small words that de-risk the sale that help you um, close those dream deals. I actually had a large customer call me up one day and, and I, I can't give you the name, but it's really big. And they said, Pat, we'd, uh, we'd like you to come in and, and talk to a bunch of our engineers. And I said, uh, sure. Um, I said, when's it coming up? They told me, I said, uh, who's the competitor? And they said, Pat, our people have had a look at you. You either take the money, or you don't take the money. We'll run it in turn, but you're the only candidate. That's when you know that you're hitting the mark in the market. It's a good question in itself. Just asking who's the competitor. Better do it. Because you don't, otherwise you won't understand where you are in the pecking order. That's great, man. Love it. Awesome. Well, everyone, you've been tuning in to Sam's Business Growth Show, where we sit down with business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. We find out their story, how digital marketing has happened along the way, and their exclusive insights and recommendations to help you skyrocket yourselves and your business. Um, Patrick, really appreciate you coming on, man. Um, how can Thank everyone you. learn from you, connect with you, and um, what's the best way to get in touch and find out more about your books? Sure. Um, so you can just Google my name, Patrick Tinney, on Amazon. Uh, if you happen to live in Canada, do the same on chapters.ca. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Patrick Tinney. Um, I'm on Twitter at Centroid Deals. Uh, my website is Centroid, C-E-N-T-R-O-I-D, marketing.com. Go on my website, have a look. There's a ton of free stuff, good stuff, and you'll get all my recommended reads. And um, just drop me a line, pick up the phone, call me. Um, anybody who wants to have a chat in my world, first 20 minutes are free. I want to make friends. Awesome, man. Thanks very much. And if you've enjoyed the show, please do subscribe on your podcast channel of choice. We've got tons of interviews with business leaders from all across the globe. So tune in on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever the heck you get your podcasts from. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming on, Patrick. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Are you tired of constantly hunting for new customers? You could be missing out on regular inbound opportunities, all because your website isn't on the first page of Google. Perhaps you're already spending lots of money on advertising, but your website is failing to convert all of your hard-earned visitors into a consistent flow of new customers. If you'd like to learn more about our unusual approach that brings idle clients straight to you, connect with Sam Dunning on LinkedIn or book a free 20-minute consultation via webchoiceuk.com. That's webchoiceuk.com. Subscribe today for more digital marketing, sales, and business growth tips from the experts.